I am joined today by, by Max Blumenthal, Senior Editor at the Gray Zone Project at Alternate. Hello, Max. Hey, Michael. How are you doing? I'm okay. Thank you. Um, so we're going to talk about a variety of topics today, which are sort of interlinked. Um, but I want to start with, naturally, Russia, because we're in the midst right now of another kind of media meltdown moment um, where there was a, you know, bit of breaking news supposedly yesterday where Donald Trump Jr., the kind of bonehead son of the president, was found to have met with somebody of Russian nationality. And this is being taken as the smoking gun um, to prove some kind of collusion and ultimately remove Trump. We don't have to get into the details of this particular story because it's just another example of people kind of amping themselves up in anticipation of some kind of you know, final uh, final way to overthrow Trump, um, and that ne never comes, oddly, once people kind of settle down for a minute. Um, but what do you make of this trend where people get worked into a frenzy like every week or so over some yeah. revelation, and then they kind of like, they come down from the high like a day or two later, and to me, it seems like you're breeding a sense of fatigue and, and cynicism. It doesn't seem like a healthy way for the media to operate. No, and you, you get into you get to one story and you forget the last one. Like who remembers um, the story about which which was completely misreported about the um, cameraman from the Russian state news agency who was allowed into the meeting with Sergei Lavrov, um, Sergei Kislyak, the Russian ambassador to the US and Donald Trump, and how this was some scandal. Who remembers the story, <clears throat> which I think was completely spun by the intelligence agencies through a leak about Donald Trump meeting with Kislyak and then supposedly revealing um, intelligence that classified intelligence from Israel about ISIS. And I actually don't think that Israel has any human intelligence within ISIS. The Jordanian intelligence agencies came out and said it was actually them. But who even remembers this? Because this week we found out that Eric Trump met with a Russian national. No, not a Russian national. Um, and there was some possible quid pro quo about damaging information about Hillary Clinton that the Russians were supposedly going to provide, um, but the information never came. So where's, I always say, where's the borscht? Next week it'll be something else. How does this connect to the other stories? I don't really know. It's just this constant drumbeat. And so when I talk to liberals who are opponents of Trump, and you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Trump myself, um, but I dislike him for other reasons. Um, they seem to have a feeling, a general sense that there is Russian collusion, but they can't exactly put the story together in a coherent way. They don't exactly know what's happening. They don't know what Trump gave, gave up to Putin, for example, in the most recent meeting where it said that Putin won because of body language analysis and all sorts of other psychobabble. It's just, so that's the effect these stories have. And I have a sense that there are forces um, from outside the liberal grassroots that are generating these stories in order to cultivate this kind of feeling, this sense, um, without any without any actual coherent storyline um, that anyone can point to. And and so, you know, let's wait for the, the next shoe to drop, but how many shoes can drop before we start wondering if there is a story there at all? Yeah, and it was because that sort of general fake a vague feeling has been cultivated that when you look at how the Trump-Putin meeting at the G20 was covered, it was covered, like you said, entirely through the lens of this kind of like amateur psychoanalysis rather yeah. than through the lens of, I don't know, con conflict mitigation in Syria. I mean, that the, one of the results of that meeting, the fruits of it, was apparently a ceasefire. Who knows whether it's going to be effective. It could just be some kind of facade. But you would think that that would be seen by a reasonable, sober media as the main takeaway from that meeting. Instead, we got a whole deluge of memes about what, who stuck out their hand first for a handshake, um, what just kind of facial expressions Trump and Putin made. It's a totally superficial 
way to view a very complex geopolitical situation. And yet that instinct has been inculcated, especially in American liberals, because of this just kind of vague sense of that there has to become some kind of smi- uh, fire below the smoke. Um, and yeah. it's just it's, it's a real distortion. Well, first of all, that psycho babble style coverage was never present in Obama's meetings with Netanyahu, where Netanyahu would completely dominate and humiliate Obama. And then Obama would give Netanyahu the store. Um, this culminated in the largest package of aid and loans, military aid to Israel in history at the end of Obama's term, when Netanyahu just flagrantly insulted Obama. The, the press never really conveyed that. And then what they're trying to do in this case with Trump and Putin is to look for every physical detail in their interactions without conveying to the American public any political context or what the negotiations were about. And then you see, if you go on Twitter, you see all the blue check marks howling, we don't know what was happening in that meeting because there was no one there to transcribe it from the National Security Council. You know why no one was there from the National Security Council, like Dina Powell or H.R. McMaster? Because McMaster and Powell have been the ones leaking the content of all the other meetings, for example, like the meeting with Lavrov and Kislyak. I'm pretty convinced McMaster was the source on the supposed Israeli intelligence on ISIS. So you have to have a closed meeting, but it's obvious what the meeting was about. It's obvious what was accomplished, what the deal was. And so the deal was a ceasefire in southwestern Syria, which is something that anyone should support because it's going to save lives. Uh, There has been a major rebel offensive around Kalamun and the Golan Heights in southern Syria, and it's involved Al Qaeda's local affiliate as well as an ISIS sleeper cell operating in in coordination with U.S. and Jordanian-backed Free Syrian Army units or former Free Syrian Army units. And it's been causing havoc. Um, You know, we can talk about what the ceasefire means later, but this simply means de-escalation. And overall, throughout Syria, there's been um, a lessening of conflict, largely because of the defeat of the rebels. The United Nations last week reported Um, through its refugee um, relief agency, that 440,000 Syrians have returned home this year alone who were internally displaced refugees because the security situation has improved. In other words, the rebels have been defeated in many places and removed from cities, and there have been uh, ceasefires. So this means more people are going to go home in southern Syria. And that's what came out of the meeting. It's not something that Trump wanted to do. It's something that the United States and Russia have been trying to do for a while. I assume the Obama administration would have attempted to do it as well because Syrian civil war needs to come to an end. But all we see in this coverage is, did Putin win? Did Trump win? And no one asks what would be won and what's so bad about coordinating these kinds of agreements with Russia In Syria, of course, it requires you actually have to know shit about things that are happening on the ground. But who, you know, who cares if you're just completely engaged in this single minded obsession with impeaching Donald Trump? And think about how insidious this is. And I I have to believe that this will have some kind of a long term corrosive effect just on the psyche of American liberals. But think of how insidious it is that. At least in the minds of you know the the major media liberals and the people who follow them you know in the in the public, that it's now seen as some, somehow antithetical to the progressive agenda or the liberal agenda for the United States to be brokering some kind of peace agreement or you know a conflict mitigation agreement with a major nuclear power. I mean, in a, a, a in a in a in the pre-Trump era, in the era where people weren't totally blinkered by. Trump, I mean, that would be seen rightly as a triumph, and it would probably, if Obama had done it successfully, it, he would have been heralded. But you, because the domestic political climate now has just gone so deranged, people can't look at what's been actually accomplished with any impartiality. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in, in a way, it's always been like that. I mean, I remember during the '90s, the you know Republicans in the Senate, when Trent Lott was the majority leader, they were 
you know, the greatest anti-war heroes when it came to bombing Iraq. They were coming out and calling Operation Desert Fox a wag the dog operation that is, you know, attacking civilians. You know, this neo-Confederate guy from Mississippi was, you know, an anti-war hero. It was pure partisan politics. Um, then, you know, you'd, you'd see these huge anti-war protests during the Iraq war. And I remember seeing signs people were carrying saying, I'm a moderate, I'm not necessarily against war. And it was like full of caveats, but <laughs> yeah. this one had in George W. Bush is, you know, a disgrace. And, or or, you know, or the ultimate caveat was Barack Obama himself saying, I'm not against all wars, I'm against dumb wars. That line like exalted him into the national you know, right. consciousness. And like he, he used that as a selling point for his first candidacy. But the, but the point is the war had become unpopular for Bush, and so partisan liberals had decided to come out, and the ranks of the protests swelled by hundreds of thousands. I mean, I was protesting the war outside um, the federal building um, where you are in L.A. on the on the night of the war, and almost no one was there except for you know uh, you know some radical leftists and really a random assortment of people, um, and we were just constantly heckled by passersby. Um, and that's what the um, Russia, I don't want to call it Russia gate, maybe you could call it Russia hate, but that's what, it, that's what it feels like. That's what it feels like when I go out and try to argue that it would be great to de-escalate the Syrian civil war and that the only way to do so is to coordinate with Russia. Um, but you're dealing with people whose only political framework is through a partisan analysis. And I guarantee you, Michael, I guarantee you that if Trump is impeached, uh, if the Democrats score massive victories in 2018, or if Trump basically doesn't run again for doesn't run for a second term, which would probably leave us with you know a Pence Haley ticket, um, these partisan liberals, the you know the the so-called resistance, will forget that Russia ever existed, and their obsession with Putin will just simply fade away, and they'll pretend it the whole thing never happened. It will leave lasting geopolitical damage for sure. Um, but they can just move on to another boutique issue. And when I say boutique issue, I mean an issue that regular people can't really relate to. I mean, I, I grew up in D.C. I live in D.C. I know the city uh, inside and out. And there was a recent poll that showed the Washington Post just reported on it that over 50 percent of white people in Washington, D.C. have protested Donald Trump. Uh, only 17% of DC's black residents have protested Donald Trump. Black DC's a black city. It was when I when I grew up it was 80% black. They called it CC or Chocolate City. Um, you know, it's become about 50% black. It's one of the most heavily gentrified cities. There's been an effort to completely um, dis destroy the legacy of Marion Barry, who created lots of programs. They've been trying to privatized the school, turn them into charter schools. And, you know, the center, the center of the city, the Shaw area has just become, you know, you could call it Cappuccino City now. And so when you talk to longtime residents of DC who are from Ward 7 and Ward 8, which are like the working class and poor black areas, which are the real heart of the city, um, they say, yeah, we don't like Donald Trump, but we don't, we're not why would I, I don't, they don't understand. They didn't relate to the women's March. They especially don't relate to the Russia stuff. And there's nothing speaking to them in any of the kind of um, hoopla that the so-called resistance is putting on. It's not a real resistance. It is really a reflection of the anxieties of a coastal elite um, who has a lot of skin in the game when it comes to empire and gentrification is sort of the domestic reflect um, echo of, a, of empire and the empire is dying. So they're projecting it all onto Donald Trump. Um, this Russia hysteria has to do with the anxiety of a dying empire and the, the weakness of the U.S. at the G20 wasn't all the result of Donald Trump. It was because of the U.S.'s general position in the world which it has placed itself in through a bipartisan foreign policy consensus that's prevailed since the Cold War. So you can really see it at a micro level in D.C. and see how it's playing out in the so-called resistance to Trump. That's really interesting. I think, you know, since the beginning, once the term resistance was coined, um, it was been, it's been clear that 
the adoption of that nomenclature was intended to create the sort of facade of radicalism to kind of yeah. mask what is essentially an establishmentarian agenda. I mean, the people who are using that the resistance trademark, you know, resistance with a little trademark logo, um, are are people who whose reputations were completely wrecked by the failures of 2016 and had to find a way to rehabilitate themselves. And to do that, they kind of whip up this kind of phony appearance of a radical critique when really it's not a radical critique at all. It's totally status quo. I mean, look at the the, the Democratic Party, the DNC uses the term resistance. Um, yeah. So the idea, uh, so, so it, it's, it's, it's really kind of odious for them to give people the impression that adopting these kind of surface level critiques of Trump is in any way kind of like a structural critique. Um, yeah. And yeah. It's, you know, the, the, the point you made about the, you know, the black residents of Washington, D.C. is interesting. You know, I'm, I'm, think, I'm thinking back to around the time of the election last year. I was traveling around the country and I went to a whole variety of different places, including, you know, some heavily black places, especially in the South. And I would talk to just, you know, regular black folks about how, what they thought about Trump. And my impression was, you know, very few of them had anything positive to say about Trump. But they weren't like in the, this mindless frenzy about Trump that I think characterizes a lot of the affluent coastal liberals. And yep. I made that observation on social media. And of course, I took a torrent of hatred over it. But you know, I think it. I think there is something there that needs to be explored in terms of the discrepancy in the way Trump is viewed between you know these 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 you know, wealthy elites who have clustered around New York, D.C., L.A., and a couple other places, and people who are on, lower on the socioeconomic rung um, who, who don't, don't see Trump with the same, quite the same level of hysteria. Yeah, I mean, you just look at what's happening in Ward 8 in D.C., which is across the Anacostia River. It's a place where, you know, the white gentrifier class and, you know, white professional class in D.C. just doesn't go. They have no reason to go there. Um, it's kind of been isolated. It's a, it's going to be gentrified at some time in the future, but for now it's sort of a refuge for people who've been gentrified from other areas. And their sense is, you know, nothing's changed over the past decades, um, particularly since the Clinton era when you really um, felt the, you really did feel, there was a perceptible feeling that mass incarceration was taking place. Um, so through from Democrat to Republican administrations, you don't really notice a change. There might be a change in feeling or morale when Barack Obama is elected, but there's not a, a perceptible um, you know, change in public policy that brings you better jobs, that brings you um, kind of a, a, a change in your situation. Um, you're just constantly being pushed around. And so why would Trump matter that much? I mean, it, it really has, it, it really is, the hysteria is limited to people um, who have skin in the game uh, when it comes to Trump. And uh, I don't even know if those people have a whole lot to lose from tax cuts. But I mean, it, it, it also like um, speaks to the kind of dynamic of resistance. Um, you have a whole... I mean, this is something I've been thinking about as well, is that you have a whole, I was watching this film last night called Spinning Boris. It's a great film about Russia. Uh, probably one of the best films about Russia that Hollywood's ever produced. Um, it's about three consultants for Pete Wilson, um, who is the moderate Republican governor of California, who get called by um, Felix Brainin, who is a Russian oligarch, um, who's working with the Russian mafia to save the political career of Boris Yeltsin who was the U.S. stooge who basically destroyed the Russian economy, handed it over to the IMF and a cast of oligarchs who took all the IMF loans offshore and left basically the Russian population, especially the uh, pensioners who had defeated the Nazis and won World War II for us, um, left them in the streets bartering their wares. And so they bring in American consultants to use American tricks on the Russian electorate and it works, and the, and the consultants freely acknowledge they're working for oligarchs in the mafia and that Yeltsin has completely destroyed Russia. They're fielding calls from the CIA who's afraid that a communist candidate might win and reorder the economy. And you think about the consultant class in the U.S. They've been doing these kind of elections since the 90s where they go overseas 
um, and they run in opposition to a nationalist candidate. That's the kind of campaign they're now running against Donald Trump. And they're, the entire campaign against that saved Yeltsin was to go negative in the end because he had no program and he could give nothing back to the Russian peasantry, the, the, the poor without land who live in the rural areas. He could give nothing back. So it was just purely about fear of communism returning and civil unrest. And you look at the kind of campaign that the opposition in Venezuela is running. They have no political program, no leadership, no clear leadership. It's just a campaign about a fear of civil unrest by actually causing civil unrest and warning that you know Venezuela has turned into Cuba. Same thing with the Syrian opposition. Who leads the Syrian opposition? On the ground, they're led by Al Qaeda's local affiliate, but who would replace Bashar al-Assad? Nobody knows. They have no leader. They have no political program. Uh, any country where the U.S. seeks regime change, any country where you know there's a color revolution, there's really no political program. Look at Ukraine right now. That's the kind of mentality that the consultant class has brought back to the U.S., and that's really what the resistance is. There is no political program. No one knows who the leader is. No one knows who can even run in 2020. You're going to have the biggest freak show in the Democratic primary ever, and all of them will be virtually the same uh, when it comes to foreign policy and largely on domestic policy. So this is the crisis, the real crisis that Democrats find themselves in, and average people it, for average people, um, not just you know the urban working class, but across the country, have no idea what to think about the Democrats. And it's very telling, just to close my rant, that the Democrats have chosen to kind of throw their Hail Mary pass and go long and blow their whole $25 million wad in a suburban district of moderate Republicans. They don't want to deal with regular people that used to be their base. No, I, I almost 100% agree with everything you laid out there. And in fact, I wrote a column that was published today for CNBC on um, how the Democrats kind of blinkered approach to Trump and their insistence on basically catering to elite priorities in the main has made them look just incoherent to the types of voters who I think they, they have to court in order to um, become a viable national electoral force again. Um, but I want to I want to transition to basically the American progressive media. And now there's a sort of like a trope on the right, which identifies the New York Times and NPR and the Washington Post as the liberal media. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk <laughs> about the actual progressive media, like the self-identified progressive media, um, which you and I have a bird's eye view too, I would think, um, it seems like they have really been a driving force behind this sort of diluted interpretation of what the Russia gate or Russia hate scandal sort of signifies. And, you know, very insidiously, that has, uh, that, that bears on how they cover the Syrian issue. Yeah. Um, so if you look at, for example, Mother Jones, which... I've written for in the past, you know, I've always had a relatively positive view of Mother Jones. I think historically it's made a lot of worthwhile contributions to journalism. But, I mean, it's impossible to miss at this point what they're evidently doing, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. they just explicitly decided to join forces with the founders of this propaganda group called PutinTrump.org. Yeah, I mean they 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 merged, um, so the the people who who ran PutinTrump.org are now leading the editorial um, uh, team in within Mother Jones on the Russia issue, and obviously, that, and again, that has a bearing on Syria. And I mean, if you go look at PutinTrump.org, it has emblazoned on its logo the hammer and sickle. I mean, yeah. so it's like the yeah. most the most kind of out there conspiratorial view of. The Trump Russia issue is now being adopted wholeheartedly by one of the the leading American kind of tribunes of pro, uh, progressive journalism, and you know David Korn is obs totally obsessed with yeah. this, um, but yeah. beyond parody almost. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, and th there obviously is a huge commercial incentive to keep feeding this beast because a lot of 
aggrieved liberals who are you know on the internet all day because they're in some kind of like creative class profession and they they don't like their job so like they spend half the day scanning Twitter and Facebook. Um, they want to click on stuff which kind of validates their like deepest darkest suspicions about what's going on with the Trump Russia issue. Um, and uh, so again, there's a, there's a commercial incentive there, and I think. So it's hard to sort of separate to what extent they are going down this road, meaning Mother Jones and others, because they simply are responding to the commercial incentives, or because they have a genuine belief now in uh, in like the just some sort of like on a philosophical level about what this all is supposed to indicate. Um, yeah. So h- h- how do you perceive all this? You know, I don't know what happened to Mother Jones, but. It's happened across the board and, you know, at the nation, there's this internal battle going on right now, which has gotten very ugly um, for anyone who's uh, in progressive media. You could probably follow the Facebook threads of any nation editor to see what's going on. But Mother Jones, I mean, they're taking money from this oligarch who also funds Real Clear Politics, which is a right wing site. um, And that's who's behind the um, TrumpPutin.org. Um, just this, 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 this sham excuse for investigative journalism, which has turned up absolutely nothing. And David Korn would have been someone who would have been red baited in the eighties because he was actually doing valuable work on Reagan and the Contras. And, you know, the, the magazines run by this woman, Clara Jeffrey, who just seems completely unqualified from my point of view, um, based on what I see her say on Twitter she doesn't she know basic facts of American history and politics um, she apparently lives in a she's boasted about living in a mansion she embodies all the qualities of the kind of out of touch East Coast elite that would well she's in San Francisco so she's in the West Coast elite yeah, but it's the same sort of people same things you know and you know there's all kinds of Silicon Valley coming into media but i also think there are just cultural problems i mean these people live in a bubble and they're 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 falling in they're kind of like scentless silly putty that's molding around the russia hysteria and accommodating it without thinking about any consequences i feel like david corn should know better um but as you said he's you know it, he's almost become self uh, self satire i remember when the russia hy- hysteria died down he was complaining that the Democrats were starting to, you know, talk about economic issues and other issues. And he's like, where's the big scandal? We need to get back on this. What about the steel memo, the dossier? Um, I, I think for a lot of liberals, again, who are focused on partisan politics and um, they're going to follow this issue to its terrible conclusion because they think that it's a silver bullet against Trump. And the reality is that there are a lot of commercial ties between Trump and Russia um, because Trump had lost his investors in the U.S. There are much more commercial ties in the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia where they have bigger sovereign wealth funds. This is about sleaze. It's not about collusion. And um, they've managed to c- create the drumbeat of scandal, and Trump is one of the most inept political operators in modern American history and has ensnared himself in an investigation uh, through Robert Mueller because of the mock scandal the Democrats have created. So any interference is going to be treated with complete hostility. And it's also a proxy for the longstanding battle between the kind of liberal center and the left. And that's really what's playing out at the nation. And you can see the cast of characters who are holding fast to the Russia narrative at the nation um, are battling people who have experience uh, covering foreign policy, who actually understand Russia as a country and understand uh, the role that it plays, not only in Eastern and Central Europe, but also in the Middle East, and are are either academic or journalistic experts in the field. And they're going up against kind of a cast of bloggers and partisan hacks or people who have really written about um, the domestic culture wars their whole lives. So... This is a uh, this is a this is this is part of a long-standing battle. The Syria debate has also been, in a lot of ways, a proxy war for liberal interventionists versus the left. Um, and I've you know come down pretty clearly on one side. I've actually been attacked more harshly 
for challenging the regime change narrative on Syria than I have been uh, for challenging Zionism and Israeli apartheid, um, the viciousness of the, of the people who hold fast to these kind of discredited and dangerous narratives is just something that I've never experienced before. Yeah, you know, you said yeah. that Trump is one of the most inept political operators ever, and I can see why, given his day-to-day -day follies, um, you might conclude that. But on the other hand, I mean, look at his accomplishment in winning the 2016 election. I mean, he ran against an entirely hostile Republican Party and took it over. He then ran against basically the entire elite establishment in the in, in America and won against all expectations in November. So, I mean, I think he has a shrewdness that has to be recognized, even if it can get lost amidst this kind of like everyday furor, which is why I think, for example, Seymour Hirsch was correct, probably, when he speculated um, in an interview on Alternate, actually, uh, that... The, the, the way that this Russia story is kind of opera, uh, functions might have the effect ultimately of strengthening Trump uh, because it sort of like discredits his opposition as sort of like cantankerous obsessives. And um, if there's nothing legally that is, he's going to be liable for, uh, some of his critiques about the fake news media or the fraud news media or whatever, like elements of it are probably going to be vindicated because there are a lot of problems with how the mainstream media operates. Um, so, I mean, I think this idea that Trump is just this bumbling incompetent um, maybe isn't the best kind of prism through which to view him at this point. Yeah, I think, I think every time he has momentum, he finds himself back in one of these kind of tabloid battles that he's used to from the New York political and media scene where – you know, he tweets out a GIF of him, you know, from WrestleMania where, you know, he was shaving Vince, Mc body slamming Vince McMahon, but Vince McMahon has a CNN logo. And this gives the CNN and the established kind of corporate media the ability to pretend that there are these Roman Christians hiding out in the catacombs and that they're this dissident media and that Trump has put their lives in danger. And this is right after he's gathered so much momentum um, with the Project Veritas videos and the resignation of three CNN uh, con contributors. I mean, for the first time, CNN actually had to impose editorial guidelines because one of the people it smeared over Russia actually fought back. Um, so I thought Trump had the advantage, and then he found himself in, you know, in one of these kind of sideshow battles again. I don't know, but perhaps, uh, you know, keeping the drumbeat going on CNN benefits him. I mean, I hate CNN for different reasons because. You know, you turn on Jake Tapper every day and he's just basically a shill for the State Department pr promoting regime change all day. Um, but many people really dislike corporate media and Trump's uh, election. You know, that's what really that's what it vindicated. I think that's another aspect of Russia hysteria is it papers over um, those who are pushing it are using it to paper over not only their own failures, but how much the American public hates them just absolutely hates them. Whether it's CNN or the intelligence community or the, you know, or, or, or the, you know, those who are pushing war abroad. I mean, I remember in 2004 and 2008 when Ron Paul would run in the Republican primaries and he would always come up 2008 with- 2008 like, you know, and 2012. Yeah. yeah, sorry, 2008, 2012. He'd always come up with these, um, you know, low totals. But when he'd run in South Carolina, he'd do relatively well, and you'd look at where he would win. It was the district the, with the largest concentration of, of, of military bases Yeah, because the soldiers didn't want to go to Iraq. And this kind of – He got the most – of all the Republican candidates, I think in both 2008 and 2012, he received the most financial contributions from active uh, duty military. Yeah. I mean this sort of presaged – Donald Trump's anti-interventionist message. And I think, you know, it was crafted for Trump. This was partly Bannon uh, kind of crafting the anti-establishment populist campaign he'd always imagined. And Trump went out there and delivered it. He delivered the goods and he hammered Jeb Bush, who was an original signator of the Project for a New American Century, on 9-11, something that the press thought, if you look at the articles the next day, the coverage of that debate, CNN and elsewhere, it's that um, Trump has finally destroyed his presidential ambitions. 
And actually, he improved his position massively. There is a great hatred for the establishment. His Trump's closing message, uh, it was a two-minute online ad. Hillary Clinton also introduced a two-minute online ad. And you look at the, the coverage in Talking Points Memo or other progressive publications of Trump's closing message, it's that it was anti-Semitic yeah. because it featured George Soros and Janet Yellen. Um, okay, may, maybe there are anti-Semitic undertones. I'm not going to sit here and dispute it, but it's also true that George Soros is one of the key funders of the progressive movement and that Janet Yellen is the head of the Fed and that people despise uh, the Fed's pol people on the right and many people in middle America despise the, the policies the Fed has been setting. And, and but it, was, it was amazing because the sole takeaway from that ad that appeared, like you said, on the eve of the election was that it was just this anti-Semitic uh, dog yeah. whistling. And it, there was no recognition of the fact that the message overall that it was propagating was really salient for a lot of people, which is that like, yeah. you're being screwed over by the world financial screwed. system. Yes, historically, that has been a trope that anti-Semites have used. But there's a way to talk about that subject without lapsing in to anti-Semitic nonsense but there, but pe people like Josh Marshall at talking points memo you know just, just weren't interested in, in, in looking at what, what, why it is that that, mesh, that issue or that message would have resonance well if you are going to admit that that was a very effective closing argument for Donald Trump to make and it was a very simple closing argument the establishment has screwed you from I both won. parties right you've been screwed over by trade deals from Clinton to well, Bush to Obama Clinton. Yeah. You've been treated very badly by both parties and I'm going to bring your job back, whatever. It's very simple. I actually remember Matthew Dowd, who is a veteran Republican consultant, right after Trump won the nomination, um, commented, this is going to be like Somali pirates. Um, the Trump campaign will be like Somali pirates. And Hillary Clinton is a giant oil tanker. Um, and I thought that was a pretty apt metaphor. And that's how it played out. And the Trump uh, consultants were saying, you know, this is going to be pretty easy. So anyway, in order to acknowledge the effectiveness of that ad, you have to actually acknowledge that your heroes, Barack Obama or Bill Clinton, treated the American working class very, very badly. Um, and they've screwed over their traditional base and the Democratic Party is no longer the party of the people. But you can't do it. So you have to focus on the anti-Semitic dog whistling to the extent that it was there. That ad was really effective. Hillary Clinton's ad was all about hate and love trumping hate and you know intolerance. There are no issues there. It's pretty well known that Bill Clinton, you know, who did you know the, was the author of NAFTA and shafted the workers, um, was furious about Hillary Clinton's messaging and had to be kept away from her by her you know thirty something and millennial staff because he wanted to talk about jobs and go with a big economic message at least to win. So Trump easily won. The same thing happened with Brexit. And for the first time, we've seen a left-wing alternative in Jeremy Corbyn. And of course, everyone predicted that he would lose, that he'd be the biggest disaster for the Labour Party. It's actually not very hard to win an election in a West that's been shattered by austerity, uh, where people uh, you know, have been, as particularly in the US, have seen their you know, sons and brothers come home from these imperial wars with their legs and arms blown off and their face filled with shrapnel. It's actually not that hard. Trump delivered that message. I think he was actually a pretty poor messenger, but the message resonated and the Democrats don't appear ready to field anyone with an anti-establishment anti -establishment message for 2020. I mean, the closest we can imagine might be Elizabeth Warren. And if you look at her foreign policy positions, I mean, she lets APAC basically write her positions on the Middle East. Not that Americans vote on foreign policy, but it shows a lack of authenticity. And over the 4th of July holiday, she traveled to Afghanistan with uh, John McCain and Lindsey Graham, and she fl flanked McCain when he was standing there at the podium calling for yet another troop surge in Afghanistan. So I don't know if yeah. Elizabeth Warren herself has endorsed that position, but she seemed to tacitly endorse it because she was standing there and it was it was a statement made on behalf of the senatorial delegation that was in Afghanistan. Um, yeah, I mean, look at Jamie Raskin, who was supposed to be the great progressive hope, and you know, partly represents Tacoma Park in Montgomery County here in D.C., which is 
one of the most liberal districts, maybe the, as liberal a district as Berkeley, California. And this guy is running around calling for regime change in Venezuela, Syria, and even the Philippines, which just had a demo democratic election. Um, he's basically letting the, um, you know, think tankers write his foreign policy positions, these beltway hack think tankers. And the same thing's happening with Elizabeth Warren because he's hyper ambitious. And I think he might want to get in the Senate. So this is the son of Marcus Raskin, Marcus Raskin, who founded the Institute for Policy Studies, the main left wing, anti-imperialist, anti-war think tank in Washington. And he's just thrown that whole legacy away because he has an ambition you know, for something more in Congress. And I just don't understand where that comes from. I really think that we're at the point where you can challenge that narrative openly and people will reward you. You can challenge the whole war on terror, something that's made us less safe, as Jeremy Corbyn did right after the Manchester bombing, after an ISIS cadre blew up over 20 people at a concert in the middle of Manchester. He comes out and says, this is the fault of our imperial wars and we are creating this terror. And 75% of British voters told YouGov, the polling agency, that they agreed with Corbyn. And I think this is a key factor in his victory. We're not seeing any kind of courage um, on the part of the Democrats here. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I think back to the debate before the Republican primary in South Carolina in 2016, where Trump went on this rant about how Bush lied the country into war and there were no weapons of mass destruction. Remember that? That was probably one of the, the best moments of the campaign, yes. honestly, because um, he said it right to Jeb's face. And it was the, the first time that the Bushes have ever been held accountable in public for a war that killed one million Iraqis and just shattered so many American families. Yeah, but the, the pundit assumption at the time was that, oh my goodness, this will sink Trump's hopes in South Carolina. The people of South Carolina are just so endeared to the Bush family that they'll never... Uh, they'll never accept this kind of hardline critique. And of course, Trump won in a landslide a couple of days later. So it shows that, you know, this shifting attitude toward this constantly you know, perpetual war and this, this, uh, this never ending imperial kind of belligerence. I mean, that's, that, that, that's been sh that's shared on all across the political spectrum. It just takes a the the right kind of political operator to to capitalize on, upon it and the fact that it, that task was left to Trump is sort of an indictment of the re other politicians who could have done something similar if they weren't so in hock to the status quo yeah i mean and you talk about progressive media i mean where is the where or or just media in general but particularly, this is a particularly a, a commentary on progressive media. Where's the only place where a dissident intellectual or journalist can go before the American public um, in the broadcast media and challenge the hysterical Russia narrative or challenge the regime change narrative on Syria as Representative Tulsi Gabbard did? It's not on MSNBC. It's not on progressive media. It's not on Chris Hayes's show. Chris Hayes, who is a, you know, alumnus of the Nation magazine. It's on Tucker. It's on Tucker Carlson's show. I mean, what does that say about progressive media that Tucker Carlson is filling that void? I mean, it shows that pro progressives are basically imperial Cold War liberals uh, who simply go wherever the partisan agenda takes them. I know. I, I've actually appeared on Tucker's show. Um, I, I wasn't told to say anything. I, I, I spoke my mind um, as, as I, and I said what I think is true, uh, but I would have just as willingly gone on MSNBC or any other show to say the same things, um, but there's no appetite for it in those precincts. Um, oh, you know, oh, if, if the the, the yeah. coverage of Tulsi Gabbard was probably the most vicious on MSNBC. It was on yeah. MSNBC that Howard Dean after uh, Tulsi Gabbard questioned uh, the utility of rushing to launch 59 Tomahawk missiles at a Syrian airbase in April, Tulsi Gabbard said, hey, maybe we should cut, sort of pause and confirm that we have the correct intelligence here. She received an onslaught of criticism, most, most viciously on MSNBC, and Howard Dean got on the air and called for her to be primaried. I mean, she, it, her even being in Congress 
was untenable after she questioned those orthodoxies. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Tulsi Gabbard's been absolutely pilloried for challenging the regime change line on Syria. Uh, she went to Syria and came back issuing, uh, calling for a, a bill that would block the House Appropriations Committee from funding groups like Arar al-Sham and Jabhat al-Nusra and all, um, you know, all, basically the Free Syrian Army the U.S. created and the CIA trained and supported through the operations rooms in Turkey and Jordan has folded into these Salafist and Salafi jihadist militias. And you see al-Nusra, which is al-Qaeda's local Syrian affiliate, operating in the field in Syria with U.S.-made anti-tank tow missiles. Um, they're being armed by the U.S., even either directly or indirectly, but it's pretty much direct at this point. What Tulsi Gabbard's resolution uh, bill should have done should have been relatively uncontroversial, but it interfered with the kind of imperial machinations which are aimed at bleeding Russia by extending the Syrian civil war, bleeding Syria, bleeding Iran. And for Howard Dean, why does Howard Dean care so much about that? Um, I think he should have been forced to acknowledge or disclose on the show that he has taken massive cash payments from the Mojahedin al-Kalk, or the People's MEK, yeah. which is yeah. an authoritarian cult of personality run by Iranian exiles, which is dedicated to regime change in Iran, in Syria, and beyond, which is very close to the pro-Israel lobby, and which has just paid off a who's who of former U.S. Uh, foreign you know, in intelligence and law enforcement officials like Michael Mukasey, and even Howard Dean. Howard Dean has been one of the strongest advocates of the MEK. And so he's brought on MSNBC simply as the former chair of the DNC and, you know, former governor. And, you know, he represented the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party. No, Howard Dean is a paid off hack working for an Iranian exile terror cult. And this is not disclosed. Anyway. I, I would, would have thought Tulsi Gabbard would have been rewarded, um, even though her positions have been far from perfect. Um, I mean, she's taken terrible positions on other foreign policy issues, but you would have think, thought she would have been rewarded for challenging another pro-war uh, narrative, challenging more intervention in the Middle East. She was attacked in progressive media, and only Tucker provided her with a sort of friendly audience. And so that's where we're at. You know, and this goes back to the point on the sort of valorization of the corporate media or the mainstream media by progressives who see Trump out there demonizing the media and using kind of stupid attacks to uh, show that the, the media is just out to get him on a witch hunt and that they peddle fake news. Um, but what I think we see happening is that the, a, a critique of the corporate media, which so many Americans agree with to some extent, has been ceded to Trump. I mean, so he's yep. the one who is who it's fallen to to make an argument about how the, the way that the media functions in this country has serious problems. Um, and you have people in the progressive media, you know, rushing to the defense of the Washington Post, where you know the where the intelligence services leak to on a regular basis to like push their preferred narrative. I mean, the New York Times now are sort of like martyrs that need to be kind of adulated. And, and, and CNN are like these uh, seen as, you know, uh, again, like the saviors of, of, of democracy, which is ridiculous. I mean, Jim Acosta, who's like the White House correspondent for CNN and who gets attacked by Trump. I mean, this guy is supposed to be this f folk hero now. But um, go back. People were saying, you know, you're tough on Trump, but you weren't tr tr tough on Obama. So in his own defense, he said, yes, I was tough on Obama. And here's what he cited to demonstrate that he was tough on Obama. In uh, in 2014 or 15, I'm sorry, uh, Jim Acosta stood up at one of these press briefings and was and asked Obama, "quote Why can't we take out these bastards with res respect to ISIS?" <laughs> so he was real tough on Obama that Obama wasn't belligerent sufficiently belligerent in terms of conducting his conduct of foreign policy. So that was what Jim Acosta that. thinks is like his real dissidence. Uh, I remember. And, and, and it's, it's just amazing because, I mean, these people don't deserve valorization. They actually deserve scorn. Maybe Trump's variation of the scorn isn't the right approach, but it shouldn't be left to him to be voicing these criticisms. No, no. 
But why can't we say that we hope Trump and CNN eat each other alive? I mean, we barely see I mean, this is this should be like Alien and Predator. It should be like Godzilla and Mothra. That's the way that anyone who's in progressive media should see it. It should be like Saudi Arabia versus Qatar. But instead, it's, you know, we have to circle the wagons and defend journalists from Trump, uh, Trump's authoritarianism. Like, I'm sorry, he's not going to get Jim Acosta killed. Um it's just not going to, I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, somehow it'll happen and journalists will be showing up at my door blaming me for it. But I really don't think that's what's going on here. Um, and when you look at progressive media in the Obama era um, or even in the Bush era uh, versus now, you, you would have seen a const, constant messaging about the dangers of corporate media, positioning themselves against corporate media. That's pretty much gone except for places like FAIR, um, or the real news. Um, it's pretty much, you're just not, you're just not seeing even the language of corporate media anymore. It's a circling of the wagons. There's very little political space between mainstream and progressive media with Trump in office. Um, and there actually was in the Bush era. You're seeing praise for neoconservatives in progressive media like Jennifer Rubin. Um, the valorization of David Frum has not been sufficiently challenged. Uh, George W. Bush now enjoys a over 50 percent approval rating from yeah. registered there, were, there was a, there was a piece in the weekly standard that came out a couple days ago by Stephen hayes basically criticizing trump's meeting with putin as a capitulation and of course this was eagerly circulated by all the, the typical progressive media luminaries yeah and and they don't seem to be cognizant of the fact that you know their critique of trump vis-a-vis -vis russia basically is a perfect mirror image of the neoconservative critique. Now, the neoconservatives, because they're very slick operators, have tried to be slightly accommodating to Trump in certain respects. But yeah. on occasion, you know, this was more evident during the campaign, but even now, on occasion, they'll come out and voice a full-throated criticism. And because Democrats and, and, and liberal media types are so guided by just kind of simple aversion or opposition to Trump, they yeah. kind of latch on to these critiques – and, and treat them as as virtuous, even though they're they're kind of they're they're promoting a, the 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 destructive ideology that has gotten us mired in this imperial insanity. Well, yeah, I mean, the neoconservatives really started the drumbeat about Russia around Ukraine, and one of the signal moments for them, which was coordinated with the Foreign Policy Institute, and I wrote about this for Truth Dig, Bob Shears outlet, which has been a pretty principled publication throughout this all because Bob Shear is he's been around and he gets it. Um, but they um, we, we talked we wrote about how the Foreign Policy Institute, which is the successor to the neoconservative project for a new American century, helped coordinate the resignation of Liz Wall from RT um, over um, Putin's annexation of Crimea. Um, which occurred after the U.S. backed a coup of a democratically elected government in Kiev. So, you know, everybody cheered on Liz Wall's resignation. Chris Hayes, Hayes said it was remarkably badass. And I showed how it was actually part of a larger project. Um, William Crystal, who is one of the, you know, directors of the Foreign Policy Institute, said that, the Amer that he lamented in a column at this time that the American public was war weary and what they needed was a rallying. And so the rallying began with Ukraine. Um, the arms that went into the Ukrainian military, which were then forked over to um, neo-Nazi militias like the IDAR Battalion and the Azov Battalion, uh, ra increased profits for the arms industry, which funds the neoconservative movement. The neoconservatives viciously attacked Obama um, over the reset, the attempted reset with Russia. Um, and this narrative sort of just carried over into 2016 after there, there were, you know, story after story about Russian cyber penetration into the DNC, which is a separate issue we can talk about. And now it's become not only mainstream, but we see uh, some catering to it, even in publications like The Intercept, which I thought existed to challenge not narratives like this. And, you know, The Intercept even published a leak which supported the whole narrative of the so-called deep state, the national security state. They actually published a leak, the leak by Reality Winner, um, who was this low-level contractor. I don't know how she got access to this document. Basically attempting to validate the NSA's conclusions. And the Intercept had previously been 
um, the chief antagonist of the NSA and its whole domestic surveillance apparatus, its international surveillance apparatus. Why are they doing this? It's just, just to stay relevant in the Trump. Another story that I saw from The Intercept um, was about, was a leak of a meeting between Trump and um, President Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines. And it was just a little excerpt of the meeting where Trump and Duterte are kind of patting each other on the back and saying, hey man, I like you, let's be friends, which is kind of just banal stuff that happens between two leaders. And this was sold as sort of evidence that Trump is um, emulates these evil dictators, I mean, Turkey is democratically elected, who like to kill their own citizens. As if Obama Turkey. didn't exchange pleasantries with a whole variety of world leaders who we might not have a favorable opinion of, right? Well, the more shocking element to me is that Pierre Omidyar, who owns The Intercept, um, owns one of the main opposition outlets in the Philippines, Rappler, and that's how this leak was coordinated. And Rappler is sort of, you know, on the side of the you know, Arroyo kind of right wing imperial Filipino tradition. Um, why? So it, it just sort of contravenes the whole mission of that website. And I don't know how this is happening, except that, you know, again, they're trying to stay relevant in the Trump era. And what they're winding, what they wind up doing is reinforcing the narrative of the national security state that the intercept was, I thought was established uh, to combat, and which they've been, you know, traditionally pretty effective at. Um, this extends to democracy now. Just day after day, they cover Russiagate and ignore other stories. They ignored Cy Hirsch's report on the chemi alleged chemical attack in Khan Sheikhoun in Syria. Um, their general tone on Syria has been supportive of the regime change narrative. And, you know, I just think this is, again, about appealing to their donors and their listener base about Trump. So we have a uh, kind of a toxic Trump derangement syndrome that's infected the brains of lots of progressives who actually traditionally have been really effective at challenging the establishment. They want to believe that, you know, Putin hacked them, but it's really Trump that hacked them. <laughs> and it's, it's just an embarrassment. Yeah. Um, how, more spe specifically with regard to Syria, how do you think that this derangement has skewed perceptions in the, in the liberal media and I guess even more broadly of, of what's going on in Syria? I mean, you had a piece that came out on the Gray Zone Project a few days ago, which showed that uh, uh, Clarissa Ward of CNN, who won a Peabody Award for her, uh, her, her story on the situation in Syria, actually collaborated with a member of al-Nusra, um, but this wasn't highlighted by CNN or the uh, award-giving institutions. Um, you would think in other contexts that would be a pretty serious scandal, uh, but she, she received this award because according to the Peabody Award, she went undercover to northern Syria to document Russian influence. So if you're documenting Russian influence, I mean, which is now seen as this all-encompassing bugaboo, journalistic standards kind of fall by the wayside, and 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 because people associate Russia with Trump, and uh, I, I think you're seeing it's just a toxic effect that when people who have like me and, and others and, and have voiced criticism of this Russian narrative, we've always said that you're creating a toxic environment whereby even issues that you don't immediately associate with Trump, such as uh, Syria, are, the, the perceptions are going to be skewed because you're. The, the 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 Russia stuff is so all encompassing, um, so I mean, do, do you do you draw any connection between the way that, for example, that is framed and and the wider hysteria? I mean, the 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 war on Syria has been a proxy war that the U.S. has fueled along with the United U.K. and all of our Gulf allies, particularly Qatar, and the it, it was sort of considered, according to a former advisor to Hillary Clinton, the bank shot after Libya. In fact, the weapons were taken out of the um, military depots of Gaddafi's defunct military and shipped into Syria to the rebel groups, which were dominated by 2012 by Salafi jihadist groups, as I pointed out, like Al-Qaeda's local affiliate, Jabhat al-Nusra. This is a huge scandal in itself. 
I think this is one of the greatest scandals of our times is that we were fueling and providing arms to the group, the largest franchise of the international terror organization that attacked the United States on 9-11. And it continues to happen. Um, you don't hear a lot of discussion about this, partly because it is so scandalous, because it is such a terrible commentary on figures like the former CIA chief, John Brennan, CIA director, John Brennan, who's kind of the ringleader of a lot of these leaks against Trump and a lot of his um, resentment uh, against Obama and against and about all the whole Russia situation comes from Syria. The rebels were his baby and he wanted a big operation and then he wanted the U.S. Air Force to come in, provide air cover and do a decapitation strike so the rebels could take over. We saw what happened in Libya when they took over and the U.S. and Qatar were arming those rebels. Libya has basically been destroyed as a state. Um, it became a base for ISIS and Al Qaeda. Um, the main disembarkation point for conflict-torn refugees from sub-Saharan Africa, which has fueled the refugee crisis in Europe. That refugee crisis has fueled the rise of the far right. And our proxy war in Syria has torn that country apart. But the, but the state managed to hold on. It managed to hold on with support from the Russian military, which it called on uh, to defend its sovereignty against all of these proxy forces. Um, that meant that the 40% of Syria's population who are minorities were not ethnically cleansed, although many of them have been slaughtered by the proxies we've been supporting. They managed to hold on. I mean, Syria's Christian community has been driven out of the areas that rebels have taken, but they held on. It meant that the advance of ISIS stopped. And this isn't just according to me, it's according to Secretary of State John Kerry. Look at the comments he made in leaked audio with Syrian activists. This is reported uh, widely that he, I mean, he told them, look, we were watching ISIS, meaning we were letting them advance, and we thought we could get Assad to negotiate, meaning the US was using ISIS as leverage against Assad. And then Russia intervened. We were all surprised that they came in and they stopped ISIS. Yes, Russia and the Syrian army removed ISIS from the historic city of Palmyra, where they were destroying ancient antiquities and lynching the archeologists and just massacring people in, in those antiquities, that is the Russian legacy in Syria, and you're not allowed to point it out. East Aleppo was occupied not by revolutionary protesters, but by a collection of radical Salafi jihadist militias who had taken that area by force and were terrorizing the majority of the people in Aleppo with hell cannon fire and bombing attacks. People wanted them out. Russia came in and helped Syria remove them. Now Aleppo is at peace and people are returning to their homes. And that's been a very popular project in Aleppo. It's deeply unpopular here. And it contributed to the Russia hysteria. Donald Trump was unfortunately one of the few messengers on the national stage who warned that supporting the rebels would be dangerous, uh, which I think led many liberals to take the opposite position. Um, and so... I mean, when you talk about Syria, you're talking about another attempt at regime change in the Middle East. Syria was at the heart of the neoconservative regime change target list, and the empire failed. They were smashed in the face by Russia and the Syrian army, and millions and millions of Syrians participated in that campaign, and they're very happy. Um, the fall of Aleppo, the, the defeat of the rebels in East Aleppo might have been one of the biggest defeats for the empire since the fall of Saigon. And so this is just deeply humiliating to the intelligence community in Washington, um, to the whole liberal foreign policy community, which is interventionist, you know, embodied by Samantha Power. And anyone who challenged this narrative, as I had, was viciously attacked. Meanwhile, figures like Clarissa Ward from CNN, who went into Aleppo and into Idlib, which is the heartland of Al Qaeda. I mean, you have an entire region in northern Syria right now where the largest franchise of Al Qaeda in history has established a de facto Islamic state. Uh, their borders are controlled by Turkey. And the U.S. has played a part in making that happen. Clarissa Ward goes in with the help of one of Al Qaeda's top English language propagandist, Bilal Abdul Karim, 
This is someone who was on CNN's payroll to serve as her fixer and videographer to take her around. No other Western journalist could get in these areas because uh, they would be kidnapped or even killed. But Clarissa Ward was able to, and she returns, gets her trophy from the, you know, gets her Peabody Award. And they totally erased Bilal Abdul Karim, although he was the real reason she got in. Go, you know, if you're watching this right now, go Google Bilal Abdul Karim, watch his videos. He's just pure and simple, an Al Qaeda propagandist who's one of the only Americans who is able to embed with them and live with them. And it's because he's essentially a part of that organization. This should be a humongous scandal. Uh, we reported it in Alternet, and you know it got around a little bit on social media, but no one really took it seriously. And it's because this is part of doing business according to the Washington playbook. That's one reason. Another reason is um, that so many people among on, uh, within the liberal world on the in left media have taken the regime change position on Syria, and it's too late for them to turn back. Finally, I mean, we just have to ask, what would have happened if CNN had put a neo-Nazi on its payroll to get, grant them access to the alt-right? That would have probably resulted in the firing of whichever correspondent did it. But I don't see Clarissa Ward facing any consequences here. Yeah, and uh, we will link to that alternate piece in the description box of this video. Um, so people should go read it for themselves. And um, I think on that very optimistic note, <laughs> we will uh, we'll leave it there. So, Max, uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, great talking to you. Okay.